Um, surviving and doing okay. Oh, my dog wants to watch the lecture. One moment. Sorry, everyone, everyone else in the family is doing other stuff and the dog's pounding on the door. Um, I hope you're all doing okay. I hope you're surviving lockdown all right for those of you who are in lockdown and uh, I hope everyone else is uh, fine wherever you are, um, uh, particularly our students who are remote. I know there's lots of you who are not in Canberra. Um, let's get on with the um, Monday lecture, week five lecture. And to start off with, let's go through some um, admin. And remember, if you have questions, please make sure you ask them on the chat and uh, Leo will uh, let me know. Um, so, and, I, and I'll, I'll walk through it. First of all, we've got a mid-semester exam. Now, there's a few things to say about this. First of all, um, I think I've said multiple times on Piazza, our mid-semester exam is a, time, is a very small exam. Uh, Leo, you got a question? Okay, uh, our, our mid-semester exam is a very small exam. It's only 5%, and for that reason, it's not an ANU official. It's not a centrally run exam. There are lots of small exams. They're not centrally run. That's why it's not on the ANU timetable. All of the ones that are less than 10% and that are less than 90 minutes are not on the ANU timetable. So the fact that it's not on the ANU timetable does not mean, mean it's happening. It just means it's not one of the big exams, okay? So um, there's going to be um, mid-semester exam Monday next week, so it's a week away. Uh, the content of the exam uh, is uh, easy for you to find uh, on the course webpage. Let me just go to that course webpage. Where are we? Uh, course webpage. If you go on the course webpage and you go to assessments um, and you go to the mid semester exam here, you'll find that um, that you'll find that that it tells you all the information here. It tells you about self invigilation and um, also sample exam. You look here. There's a link here. And it will tell you, I've got to log in, but um, it, it will tell you here, there, mid-semester exam. So what you should do is you should use this mid-semester exam as an example. And you'll see in here, there's a whole lot of questions, not just four questions, but there are multiple versions of the questions. You see like there's uh, six question ones, okay? Now, obviously, I'm not going to ask you to answer six question ones, but I'm providing with six different question ones. And if you go through this, it should prepare you really well for the upcoming um, exam. Uh, and also, really importantly, if you look at the course website, my dog is going crazy and banging on the door again. Um, that's what happens when I'm doing the lecture and looking after animals at the same time. Um, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the schedule here, you'll see that the lecture on Friday is this one, revision one. Revision one is, is the mid-semester exam um, revision. I just got to let the dog out, I'm sorry. Um, so it's the mid-semester exam revision. I'm going to go through the mid-semester, the sample questions from there, and I'm happy to answer any specific questions. So if you come to that lecture well prepared with specific questions about the um, <clears throat> about the, the sample mid-semester exam, I'll try and step through them with you. Okay, really important. So please make sure you take make use of that. It's a big opportunity to to, to prepare for the exam. Um, a few other things. The exam uses self invigilation. Okay, I already had uh, examples of students who didn't necessarily do things uh, right for the lab exam and who may actually end up in a bit of trouble because they didn't take academic integrity very seriously. And when I asked them if they'd self invigilated, they said no, they kind of forgot or something didn't work. It's up to you. Uh, self invigilation is an opportunity for you. It's described on the web page. It's an opportunity for you. And of course, uh, if you've done everything right and you've self invigilated as well, then if I, if I come to you and say, look, it looks like you've done something really wrong here, then you've got the self invigilation there to support you, okay? And that's there for you. It's totally up to you, but it's there as a um, very strong piece of evidence to support your integrity. So take that seriously. <clears throat> this exam is only worth 5%. So if you have issues with getting self invigilation working, um, <clears throat> please sort that out before the exam. You should have already sorted out last, last uh, exam. And, but I just want you to take the academic integrity really seriously. There's no need to do anything silly at this point. It's worth, uh, at any point in this, in this course, not just at this point. Um, but I just want to emphasize that you should not be overly stressed about this exam. It should help you understand where you're up to, but it should not be um, overly onerous. It's 5% um, and it covers everything we've done so far. <clears throat> and I've given you a sample exam. Make sure you're strategic with your time. The exam is designed for 30 minutes, but I'm giving you 45. 
Make sure you don't spend more than 10 minutes on any question. Very importantly, you need to know that the questions are not of equal difficulty. <clears throat> they get progressively harder. So bear that in mind. I only expect a few students to successfully get the last question of the exam out, okay? So do not expect to get it out unless you're really gunning, you really think you're on top of the material, then maybe you're gonna get that out, okay? It, you, you may get it out, but I'm just saying that I'm only expecting a modest percentage. This is very deliberate, right? Because I want to be able to see where everyone sits in the class. And if everyone just got a 10 out of 10 mark, that wouldn't help you very much. And it wouldn't help you very much either, okay? So my goal is that the vast majority of students in the class pass, but only a few students will get full marks, okay? So that should be your expectation going into the exam, that that last question is going to be pretty hard, okay? But the first question you should not find difficult, same with the second one. The third one will be somewhere in between, okay? And you'll see that when you look at the sample exam. Same thing holds true there. All right. Um, some people have asked about coding style with respect to the assignments. Changing gears now, talking about the assignments. Some people have asked about coding style. Notice the course webpage talks about this, okay? Now, this is not a subject that, the, that, the, um, that we spend a lot of time on in this course. It's not, um, look down here. Coding practices and additional resources, okay? Um, uh, is that it? No, no, that's not what I wanted. Where are we? Style and quality, that's what I wanted to click. Okay, um, you get marks for good coding style. What does it mean? And there's an explanation there, okay? And the, 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 there's, there's a problem because intrinsically, quality is a qualitative measure, okay? So it's a subjective measure. And so identifying quality code is a subjective measure. I, I can't measure it to you and give, it, give you a number, okay? Whereas the, your test passing and failing, we can. We can measure that and give you a, a number. Anyway, if you have questions about that, go read what we've said about style on the course webpage. And um, then if, if there's still remaining questions, of course, just ask it on Piazza and we'll do, do what we can to answer. Finally, um, I wanted to point out that um, you've got student reps and they've made a great post on the course webpage uh, a few hours ago. And there they both uh, list their names, which is already on the course webpage. I'll remind you where it is on the course webpage in case you've already forgotten. Uh, if you go here to tutors and peers, you go down the bottom here and there's a list of your um, uh, course reps. We don't have contact ID, ID on, uh, information on the course webpage. I decided not to do that uh, in consultation with the course reps because um, we didn't want to um, have random people contacting them. But on the Piazza page, that they've all got their um, I, their, their um, university email addresses, so you can contact them privately on the on on the course uh, on, uh, via the information on the course webpage. I've pinned that, so it should be on the top of your feed in Piazza. All right, um, and, and they posted a survey on that, on that post there. So um, I, I encourage you to, to help them. Um, they're trying to get feedback on how you guys are, are going with the course. Make, make the most of that. There's a survey there and um, uh, it's, it's been very carefully designed um, and um, I really encourage you to, to, to make the most of that. Now, is there any, did anyone have any questions? No questions yet? All right, we've got a lot to do this, this uh, lecture. It should be good. We're, we're cha changing gears again and again. We're really moving out of the uh, learning Java stuff and into more interesting stuff. So um, this part here is Java. Uh, it's a relatively small unit. Um, it's it's kind of interesting. It's called type inference. Um, so let's just step through this. Now, um, the Java compiler can infer types in many contexts, which uh, means that we can cut down boilerplate code. Now, most of you know that Java is a strongly typed language, not a weakly typed language, but a strongly typed language. If you've, if you've worked with a language like Python or JavaScript, you'll know that they're weakly typed languages. Haskell and Java are strongly typed languages, okay? And they're statically typed as well, which means that the compiler knows about the types of things, okay? What type inference, inference is, is um, a new newish element of Java that allows it to figure out what type you're talking about without um, you having to say it all verbosely, okay? So you look at this example here with a generic linked list. If you've got a generic linked list, remember we did that in the last lecture, generic linked list, and we've said that this generic linked list here, S, is of type string, so it's a generic list li linked list of strings. Then on the right-hand side, um, you don't need to say which kind of generic link list you're making inside of those angle brackets. You don't need to say string in here because it's inferred, right? It's inferred from here. Um, and so uh, you all know about generic methods. We taught this in the last lecture, okay? Um, but what we can do is we can just say add a string and it can know uh, 
that, right? We did this in the last lecture. So you go back and look at the last lecture if you want, want to remind yourself about generics. But generics are tied up with type inference, okay? And we'll, we'll see more in a moment and we'll work through some code shortly. Lambda expressions. You also know about lambda expressions, right? We did lambda expressions a few lectures ago. Again, if you're confused, go back and look at the lambda expression lecture. There's, uh, you can go and read about this. Um, what's interesting here is you've got um, a, a thing which, a, a variable here called non-empty. We've given it a type here, which we said it's a predicate. Predicate is a special type um, that offered by Java for, um, especially for use with lambda expressions. And it's a predicate of strings. So it means that it, it takes a string as an argument and returns a Boolean. That's what predicates are, Booleans, true, false. Okay, so we've got here, it says the variable x, and then you've got the function, so that's the argument, argument x, and the function is this, here's the function. That's the function. That's going to return a Boolean, right? It says x length greater than zero. So what this, this lambda here will do is return um, true if the length is greater than zero. Now, um, uh, where you'll see type inference most straight, uh, most visibly in Java is with the use of the var keyword, which was introduced, I think, in Java 13. I can't remember exactly when, but relatively recently. And the var keyword means that you don't have to explicitly state the type. So here you've said var the answer equals 42. It knows that it's an integer. You say var bike new bike, it knows the bike must be, it can infer that the bike is of type, um, this bike here is of type bike. So it's inferring the type, okay? So you don't have to say, you don't have to declare bike as being of type bike. And here, in this case here, you've just declared a variable without saying what it's gonna be assigned to. And you can't do that in Java because it says that for you to use this keyword, you must initialize the variable so that it can work out what it is. So in this case here, Java could work out what type bike was by inference from saying, oh, okay, this thing here is of type bike. Likewise here, it says, oh, okay, this thing here is of type integer. Um, but here, well, we haven't, haven't done an assignment. So this is invalid as a result. Likewise, you can't do this because again, there's, there's uh, null doesn't have a type and you haven't um, properly initialized it with a valid type. You can't initialize it with null. So again, you can't do that. It'll say, hey, I don't know what type nothing is. You can't use the var keyword here. All right. So, um, and the, remember, the motivation for all of this is simply, if you go back to this sort of example, there's a lot of stuff in Java that has a lot of boilerplate, lots and lots of stuff to type. And, and the idea of type inference is that in places where you don't need to type out all that, that stuff, Let's not do it. Some of you who are sharp-eyed may have noticed that IntelliJ, if you type stuff long-windedly in IntelliJ, if it knows you don't need to do that, it'll actually collapse it away and, and write what you put in gray. Not because what you put in gray was wrong, but because it's unnecessary, okay? So it knows that Java can do type inference. You don't need to write all that stuff. So it'll make it gray. Um, so let's look at this. So uh, here, if we have a Lambda expression like this, um, here, Java can't work out the type because we, we haven't said what the type of this guy is, okay? Um, and, uh, and, oh, and, and we don't know what the return type is, okay? So, so uh, the same here. But what we can do here is declare this thing lambda to be int function, which is one of the predicate, one of the um, types that we introduced in the, in the uh, lambda expression lecture. And in this case, you can say, okay, integer is an x, uh, x is an integer, and then um, it's going to return an int, which is x plus one. Otherwise, we don't know here exactly what type it's supposed to be returning, okay? Um, it could be an int or it could be something else. All right, so we can't do this. So that's one of the constraints. Um, so it can't infer it from a Lambda expression at all. Instead, you've got to use these things, um, which we introduced in the Lambda, uh, the Lambda expressions lecture. Okay, um, this should become more clear as we move to um, some code. I'll do the mini quiz here. Where's the mini quiz? Uh, here it is. Um, and I'll publish it. And then we're gonna move on and write some code which should make all this a bit clearer. And um, what we're gonna do here is, uh, oops, just got my notes ready. There we go. And what we're going to do is, uh, it's module J13. Here we are, J13. Oops, this should be big, shouldn't it? What's going on here? There we go. 
new Java class, um, J13, uh, we're going to call it type inference. Like that. All right, there it is. We'll add it to Git. And um, <clears throat> now what we're going to do first is um, we're going to write ourselves a little simple class. Interestingly enough, um, in the next, later in this lecture, in today's lecture, I'm going to talk about container classes. Some of you may remember me um, in the context of generics talking about the pickle truck. That's a container, right? I talked about, about things having general types or specific types. And we had this, this thing called the pickle truck, which is very, very specific, ridiculously specific. And we want to make things more general. Containers are an important concept and they're coming up next in our class today. But for now, we're going to make ourselves a very simple container using generics, which I'm just going to use to illustrate some of the points in type inference. Okay, so I say public. This is an inner class, right? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, nested class. This is a nested class because I'm going to declare it a static, static um, cl um, class. I'm going to call it thing holder, and we're going to make it generic in type T. Okay, so it's a thing that this is a a class that holds things, right? It's a very, very silly. It's not a very useful thing. But later on in today's lecture, we're going to do more interesting um, containers like uh, um, maps and sets and things like that. That's coming up soon. But here, we're just going to have a very silly one called thing holder. And the point is it's generic. It's generic in the type T. That's what that angle bracket T means, okay? And if you've forgotten what this means, go back and look at the generics lecture, which we just, just went through. And it's what this class is going to have. It's going to have a value, value, of type T, that's that's what it has. It just got the value, and we need a constructor. So uh, let's do that. Write ourselves a constructor, public thing holder, right? And um, it will just take a value as an argument. Uh, the value is an argument, and it will just set um, this dot value equals value, like that. Okay, there's our constructor. Very very simple. Um, that's it. Okay, so we got ourselves a very very simple class. Now we're going to do um, uh, write a little, little main method here. And what we're going to do is we're going to create, um, we'll do things sort of explicitly first, right? So let's just do this thing holder of type string, right? So we're declaring a variable, which is going to be one of those things with a string type. And we'll call it um, holder, right? And we'll say it's a new um, uh, thing holder. And uh, we're going to initialize it with a value and the value is going to be high. All right, there we are. So we've given it a string. And so... There's nothing very magical there. Um, we've just created a variable called holder. Now, um, but what, what else we can do? Um, so the, the, that, that's just standard use of generics, um, which we have went over before. Um, but what I'm going to do now is we're going to look at how um, 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 type inference works in the setting. So what we're going to do now is we're going to say var h equals, um, and now we're going to say new, basically going to say the same thing. Right, like that. Okay, so what's happened here is no complaints from IntelliJ, which tells us that what we wrote is syntactically sound. What's happening here is uh, uh, basically Java is figuring out all this stuff. Okay, it's figuring out that H must be a thing holder of type string. Okay, and how does it figure it out? It says, well, you're assigning it a new object, and that object is a type thing holder, and you're passing it a string to its constructor. Therefore, this must be a thing holder of string. So that's the type inference. So instead of typing all of that, you just type this. And now you've got yourself a new variable called h. I've called it h for no good reason. But we've got this and you can see, you can see we just saved a bunch of uh, typing and the possibility of error if we got this wrong here. And uh, Java has figured out the type of h. All right. So um, you can we can also create a we can also do it with methods. We can so that's with a constructor, right? But we can also run a method here. We can write something like this. We can say public, public static. Um, uh, we're going to return a um, for some other type u. We're going to return a thing holder, thing holder of u's of u. All right. So um, and then we're going to call it the make holder, make thing holder something like that, okay? And then u is the value. All right. And then what we're going to do here is something totally silly. Uh, we're just going to do the same thing. We're going to say new um, thing holder um, with the value. 
So this, this, this is all pretty silly. I'm just doing this to disguise the fact this, this content here is kind of unimportant, okay? But what's, it, what's relevant is that I've created a new method here, which has a new type variable u, which is different to t. And I've said, um, it is going to return a thing holder of type u if it's given a value of type u. And what it'll do is in fact, it'll create a new thing holder using this constructor, passing it that value. All right, so you could call this thing a factory, we, this is what we call a factory method, in fact. We call this a factory method. A factory methods are methods that call new, um, to make new objects, static methods that make new objects for, um, for some reason. Uh, in this case, it's a pretty silly one. It's pretty silly, pretty silly factory method because we could have just called this constructor. But there are other times when you want to do this sort of thing. Anyway, now that we've done that, we can now make ourselves a new variable like this var hi var i equals um, thing holder um, and then just call the make, um, make thing holder and pass it some value like hello. Now, um, notice, actually, as I type, notice, notice if you look carefully, you'll see that IntelliJ has told us that it's doing type inference. Can you see that? So it says here it's doing type inference to figure out what's going on. All right, and we press enter there, like that. And in fact, this, this text here, I didn't type that in. That's just, that's just IntelliJ giving us advice, okay? So what's happening here is I've just said, I want a variable called i, and it's going to be assign the thing that got returned from this method over here. What got returned from that method over there? It's a thing holder in type u. And what's the type of u? Oh, it's hello, because that's the value. Hello is the value, so therefore it knows u is a string. Therefore it knows the type here is a thing holder u. Therefore it knows that i must be of type thing holder string. Okay, so that's how that works. Now, let me show you um, something else. Yeah, you can do something like this. You could say um, bar uh, j equals um, new thing holder. Oh, sorry, no, no, we do, we, we, I'll use the same, same thing again. We won't use new, we'll use that method again, the factory method. You can say um, thing holder dot make thing holder and we can give it some other type. Okay, so that was a string. Why don't we give it an int integer value? There you go. And it's figured out again, the J is now of type thing holder um, of integer. So it's a holder of integer types, okay? And then you can do the same thing with some other thing like var uh, k, e, k equals um, uh, thing holder dot make thing holder, um, you know, 3.142. And now it's a double. Okay, so now that means that this thing's a double, therefore u in this case must be double, therefore the return value must be a thing holder of doubles. And therefore, k must be a variable which is of type thing holder double, right? Thing holder of double. Okay, so that is the type inference um, doing its job there. Um, now, let me just show you some examples of where it doesn't work. So we'll do this. We'll say var, just like I did in the lecture, in the, in the slides, mystery equals, um, equals null, like that. And what happens here? Well, we get the red squiggly line, which shouldn't surprise you because I showed you that on the slides that it was a bad idea. Not a bad idea, it was not, not possible. Hang on, I'm just trying to hover here and get IntelliJ to tell us what's up so you can see it. There, okay, so it says it cannot infer the type because the variable initializer is null, okay? So it's telling you exactly what um, the lecture slide said. Do the same thing here, do another one. Like that, so that, you know, if I did something like this, um, it's fine to not have the initializer over here, but if you're doing, um, if you're using type inference and putting a var here, you can't do this, okay? Because let's again let, let IntelliJ explain it. It says I can't infer the type of var without an initializer, okay? Again, so you can't do that. Um, what other examples that I want to give you? Okay, we can't. Also, I was going to give you examples with um, uh, lambdas, var um, increment equals x, take x and um, return x plus one, right? That's a fine little lambda, except that um, it you can't, well, why has it done that? Uh, 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 we can't do that. Oh, we need to force this to, into an x, um, into an int. Well, 
Okay, that, that, that's one error is that, um, let's, let's just keep going because it, that's interesting in itself. Okay, I'll just comment that out. Um, the error there is just that um, you can't apply the plus in there if you don't know what the type here is. You've got an int here, but what's x? We know what x is, x could be a string. Okay, then it's string concatenation. Or x could be a, an int, then it's addition or x could be something else, right? We don't know what x is, and if we don't know what type x is, then we don't know what the plus sign is, so we don't know what the return type is, so we don't have a well-defined lambda expression. Okay, so the way we deal with this um, is we, um, uh, it, the, the way we deal with that is we have to actually, so, and, well, we can force x, we can say int x like this. Um, like that, and then we've got another problem can't cast it to an int. Okay, so again, we can't force this thing into an int. So we've got multiple problems here. Can I do this? Um, and now here I've got a different problem. Got the same problem. Okay, so we've got a variety of, of ways of doing this which are all wrong. I'm just illustrating a whole bunch of different ways that are wrong. What you actually have to do is instead use those types that we learned about you know, when we did the lambda expression thing like int predicate int, um, oh, so that's not actually not an int predicate, we want an int function. Int predicate is when you take an integer and return true or false, and int function is when you do a function on an int. Um, increment x, uh, and then we can just do this. Um, x, um, x plus one. Okay, now we're all good, because now Java knows, oh, it's an int function. Okay, it's gonna take an int and return an int. So then it knows that x must be an int, and then it knows that the return value is also an int, so it knows that's a, a regular plus uh, between an int and an int, so we're all good. Okay, so what we're going through there is wrestling with types, um, and Java trying to keep all the types, types straight and know exactly what's going on, and we're using um, um, type inference to get away from some of the boilerplate. Kind of slightly oddly, um, IntelliJ is putting the boilerplate back in, in gray, um, so we can see what's going on there, but you didn't need to type it. And if you uh, were to print this code out, that stuff would all just go away, okay? Because it's, it's, that's just, those things there are just notations. You can turn that off too. They're just notations that IntelliJ is putting there, so you know what's going on. All right, any questions from anyone? Nope. All right, let's keep plowing through the lecture. All right, next, test-driven development. Test-driven development. Now, this is an incredibly important part of software development, and it's something that you all have now become familiar with, um, even though I haven't explicitly taught it yet. Why have you become familiar with it? Because um, we've been using tests since the very first lab you did in week one. Um, you hopefully you remember that you've been doing lots and lots of tests and you guys have been doing this uh, using the CI to see how your assignments are going and um, how your labs are going and the CI how does it work it uses tests um, now what I'm going to do is teach you something that we learn um, about software engineering and that's how we do development of software projects using tests there's this the news for this lecture is so far you've been doing it all wrong what have you been doing wrong well, you'll see in a moment. There's one thing that's been all wrong. And the reason why it's all wrong is because it's impossible to teach this without doing something, well, it's not impossible. It's very hard to teach this without doing something wrong. Okay, at the end of this, at the end of this uh, slide, you, someone hopefully in the chat will tell me, what have you been doing wrong so far? Okay, now, test-driven developments defined this way. We've got the red, green, and refactor. Red, green, refactor. That's the, the red, green, blue. You can see that on the slide there. And the way we do it is we um, start off um, by, uh, first of all, we create a test that defines new requirements. We begin with a test. We, the software developer, that means you, okay? So you first, before you write any code, you write a test, okay? And then you make sure that test fails. Why should the test fail? Anyone on the chat know why the test should fail? Why do you make sure the test fails? Why, why is that step two? Does this make any sense? It should be making sense if you think about it. So you write a test, and you need to make sure it fails. That's the red, that's the fails, that's step two. Anyone got any suggestions as to why it should fail? Nope. Oh, it so much sucks not giving live lectures. <laughs> I like to see the hands go up. There's delay, I guess. Let's just wait a while. Yeah. Yeah, we've got one. Okay. Because you haven't written anything yet. That's right. Um, someone, says, someone says from online that 
that at this point, step two, we haven't written anything yet. So it should of course fail. So I've said I want a piece of code that does something something. And I've got to test to check that it does something something. Now, if I test it before I've written the code, then of course it should fail. And this is actually really important because if you don't do that, then in your test passes, if your test passes before you've written any code, you've got a big problem. Why? Because it means that your test is not actually testing anything meaningful. Because if you're getting a thumbs up having not written any code, then your test is not actually doing its job. So it's incredibly important that you start by writing a test that when there's no code there, it fails. And when we set your test for your assignment and your labs and so forth, for example, in the assignments, we say returns false on, you know, like we give you default values when we give you those little stubs. We need to design the test in such a way that we, if you don't write any code, the test will fail. That's actually sometimes tricky when something like a Boolean, because if the test just sort of tests for something that should fail, then the tests w which are expected to fail, will, will um, because that's the nature of the test, will give you a correct outcome for the person having written no code. So we have to be a bit more clever with the way we construct the tests. Okay, so step one is you create a test that defines what you're gonna do. Step two is you gotta make sure that that test is failing because if it's not failing, it's a useless test. Next, you start writing the code, okay? I'm gonna ask again in a moment, what have we been doing wrong in the first four weeks of this, this uh, semester with respect to this, this whole test-driven development? It should be pretty clear now what's, what's going wrong here. Um, then you wanna run tests to ensure that the code that you wrote is correct and you've all been doing that part, right? Um, and then once you've got it correct, then you might improve your implementation. And this is such an important idea, okay? You need to, um, and this is how we work with really, you know, my, my PhD students and my lab works with incredibly complex code. You know, when I say incredibly complex, it's some of the most complex software out there. These very large virtual machines, millions of lines of code of really, really advanced so software. And it's really hard to know it can be really hard to know that what you did was correct. We depend heavily on tests. Okay, so you guys uh, have a huge number of tests. I don't know if you realize how many tests uh, me and the tutors over the years have written. A lot of them are written by me, but the tutors have also helped. We've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tests that um, we've written for you in, um, in, in, for this course. Hundreds and hundreds of tests. And, and writing tests is actually uh, a skill, and you need to learn that. Um, and that's how you ensure that your code is correct. And the idea is that you write the stuff and you get a thumbs up and then you try and improve it to make it better, but you still want the test to pass, okay? And what's really reassuring is that when you get the thumbs up from the test, you go and commit it into Git and say, it works, okay? It may not be the best solution, but it works. And then you can go and refine your solution and make your solution better and better and better. And each time you refine it and it works, then you can commit that one, okay? This is how Git and test a driven development work together. Write your thing, get a thumbs up from the test, then improve it and then and commit it and get another thumbs up, okay? So that's how we work. And in case you're wondering, when I was working on the V8 um, code base uh, at, um, at, um, at Google, every time I, I did a commit, I didn't have, like you guys get like five or 20 tests. You know how many tests I had there for that for the Google for that code base? It was um I think it was fourteen thousand. So when I did a commit, it was fourteen thousand tests would get run. How where do those tests come from? Question: If you can you guess where did the test? There's fourteen thousand tests for the code I was working on. Fourteen thousand. Where did those forty thousand come from? How do, who who wrote those tests and how did they how did they emerge? Write in the chat um, if you have any ideas on what principle or you know, how do you decide how to make a test or in a large software project like that one, who wrote all those tests and under what circumstances did they write them? If you have any ideas, put them in the chat. Likewise, I'm still asking, I'm still keen for someone to say, what have we done wrong in the first four weeks? There's something key in this, this step of six steps that we haven't been doing um, so far in the semester. Did you get anything, Leo, on, online? Um, yes. Um I think I got a question here that's very good. Uh, were those tests randomly generated? Ah, that's a great question. Someone asked if the, if the tests are randomly generated. The 16,000 I had were not randomly generated, okay? Which is mind blowing. They're actually handwritten tests, 16,000 of them. This is a very large project, millions and millions and millions of dollars. It's Chrome, it's the browser you, you're, many of you are using, okay? So it's a big project, but they're handwritten tests. But that's a really good question because in fact, we actually use technique, that's a very important testing technique, is actually doing exactly what um, this person on, on the chat is presumably asking about. And there's a whole um, 
category of testing around that, which we call fuzzing, okay, fuzzing. And some of my colleagues at ANU um, do really interesting research on fuzzing. That is, how can you really efficiently test a piece of software by just poking random questions at it and seeing how well it responds? Okay, this is an incredibly important uh, way of finding holes in software is by poking random stuff at it and seeing if it crashes. Okay, and we do this and it's called fuzz testing. And um, all the big products uh, do that and they do that, with, um, they do that with Chrome as well. But the, I'm not talking about fuzzing here, I'm talking about actual real handwritten tests, 14,000 or so. Any more questions there, Leo? Okay, so I still haven't had the questions answered. So I'll, I'll give you the answers, folks. Um, the first one is, so far in the first four weeks, I gave you the test and you wrote code having already been given the test. You didn't start by writing a test, okay? That's not how we're supposed to do it. We should write the test first and then um, write the code. That's not what we've been doing. And as we move forward in the semester, we're gonna try and apply this, this approach. So we will write tests and then code. That's step one, that's, that's the first thing I asked about. The second one is, how did these tests get written? Who wrote them all? This is a really interesting question and I was hoping some of you would come up with uh, suggestions uh, in terms of how these tests get written. The first thing you do is you just write tests uh, based on what you think this piece of code is going to do. And in a few minutes, we're going to, in well, probably about half an hour or so, we're going to write um, code for merge sort, okay? Merge sort, which is a recursive um, algorithm. We're going to write code for that. And we're going to write tests first. So we're going to write tests that check to see if something got sorted the way we expected. So we'll write those tests. And how do we write those tests? Well, we, we, we write them based on what we think the piece of code should do, uh, sorting uh, an array. And, um, and then what results we expect back and don't expect back given what the code is supposed to do. That's one way of writing tests and that's the most obvious way of writing tests. There's another fundamental way that tests get added to the corpus. Hopefully someone can guess what that is. No one? Nothing else, Leo? Okay, every time we get a bug report, someone finds a problem with our system, we make a new test. This is a really important rule. So if there's a bug report, it means our system isn't working. So we try and distill that bug report down into a piece of code that breaks. Then we write the test and the test should now fail because our system is still buggy, right? So we write a test here and the test should pass, but it doesn't. It sh we, we know that it's gonna fail because we know there's a bug, right? So this test exposes the bug. Then we go and fix the bug and we should see this test go green. So it starts off red, it goes green. That's because we fixed the bug, but we write the test before we fix the bug, okay? So we write a test that reflects the bug that someone found and we then fix it and make that test go green. Why do we do that? Well, because A, the fact that there was a bug there means that there was something subtle that got discovered by this, uh, the person who reported the bug, and we wanna make sure that doesn't happen again, right? And so by doing this, next time someone rewrites this part of the system, which can happen with a large system, someone goes and rewrites it in a different way, that same bug might reoccur just for a completely different reason. And we have a test there that makes sure that's true. And second of all, we're just enriching our entire corpus of tests by doing this, okay? So that's the reason why we do that. So JUnit is a framework, you've all heard of JUnit. Um, JUnit is a unit testing framework for Java. There are other unit testing frameworks for other languages. Um, it's developed by a guy called Kent Beck, um, who's one of the fathers of what they call extreme programming, which is basically a software development methodology. And you can follow him on Twitter or other social media if you want to find out what Kent Beck is up to. He's an interesting guy. Um, uh, IntelliJ, as you've noticed, uh, integrates JUnit testing. So you get those little drop down menus. That's an integration of JUnit into IntelliJ. And it's useful for test-driven development. Um, and it's also um, used for bug isolation and regression testing, which is what I just explained to you, okay? Test-driven development is when you say, I want something that can do X, let's write tests first and then write the code. Bug isolation and regression is what I just mentioned a few minutes ago. And that is that, that we know there's a bug, let's write a test for it. And then we wanna make sure that bug does not get reintroduced in the future. How does it work? You mark methods with the at test and those ones will get tested. And then you've got a whole bunch of other things uh, which you can use to, to configure the testing environment. Like you can do things like, um, for example, to make sure that the tests don't run for too long and so forth. You can have timeouts and stuff like that. And then um, <clears throat> you can uh, check, you can do all sorts of fancy things. You can even check if code throws exceptions um, when it should throw exceptions, which is an interesting thing. Um, we do, we're gonna deal with exceptions later on in, in, in the class and we'll give you an example when we build something that we'll write a test that checks that when a bad behavior happens that our code that we wrote actually correctly notices the bad behavior and throws an exception. So that's interesting. Um, <clears throat> all right, time for the mini quiz. 
And where is it? Um, there's a very interesting question in the chat. Um, yep. Madden asks, um, should you create more test after you've written your code to try and root out edge cases, which means white box, white box testing? Um, should you should you create more tests? Is that the question after they've written the code? Was that what it yep. said? Yes, of course. Um, that's a great idea. It's a really good idea to um, write more tests after you've written your code. There's white well, the, the language around white box, gray box, and black box is actually very flawed and problematic, so we won't go into that one. Um, but yeah, there, 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 is, there is this, the, um, you, it's definitely a very good idea to write additional tests once you've written the code. The more tests you can write around a piece of code, the better, particularly often you realize later on that you didn't think of something. Um, you might go and add that into your code and you should add a test, a test for that thing that you hadn't considered before. So rich test corpuses help. And now, having said that, particularly if you look at the, by comparison to the, um, the, the Chrome test suite, okay, you'll notice that the tests that we're giving you for the assignment are tiny compared to something like Chrome, which has you know, 14,000. You guys are just getting like 20 or maybe 60 or 80 or 100 tests, which is a lot of tests. Once you start writing tests, you'll realize that writing 100 tests is a lot of tests to write. Now, you know, I'm writing you guys a mid-semester exam and it's gonna have, um, ooh, each one of you is gonna see about um, 20 tests and then there are lots and lots of questions, multiple versions of the exam. So I'm writing hundreds of tests just for your mid-semester exam. It takes a lot of time. Um, but um, it's very, very good in terms of understanding the correctness of your code. All right, let's move on. Collections. This is the thing I promised you a short while ago we're gonna do next. Collections, um, so we're gonna step through the collections framework. This is, becomes a core part of our course because our course, uh, one of the things in our course is uh, considers um, uh, abstract data types and data structures. We're gonna do that later on in the course. At this point in the course, we're warming up to it by looking at how Java has built in collections into the language. Later on in the course, we're gonna do some, look at those, those data types in depth, understand how they work in a lot more detail. And a big chunk of the stuff you'll do right after the semester break is diving deep into these things. And it's, 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 it's quite interesting. Okay, what is the collections framework? It's a very important part of Java. It's based on interfaces. What's an interface? You all should know what an interface is now because we did that in, I think, in week one or week two. Um, but the collections framework defines interfaces that say this um, uh, is um, a map, this is a set, this is a list, they're, they're collection types, okay? And then it allows you to have different implementations of maps, different implementations of sets, different implementations of lists, okay? That'll become clear in a few minutes. But the point is that you can say, I just want a map, and someone will give you a hash map, for example, or a tree-based map. Okay, and the detail of how it's implemented is usually unimportant in, terms of, unimportant in terms of correctness. It'll still behave like a map because it implements a map interface. What's different is it may perform differently. Okay, and you may want a hash map for this problem and a tree map for that problem because they have different performance characteristics. However, they're interchangeable at the level that they both implement the map interface. They have the same behavior, just different underlying performance characteristics. And this is really a really nice property and a really useful thing. And you'll see this in a much more detail as we go through the semester. Okay, so we've got interfaces, that's like map, list, and so forth. Then we've got concrete implementations, that's like the hash map, a tree map, and so forth. And you've got algorithms for things like searching and sorting and so on. Now, the golden rule is that when you become a software developer, you use these frameworks. Now, can anyone in the chat tell us why you should use the, sta the standard Java map or the standard Java list rather than write your own? Why should you use the standard Java lists or the standard, all of the, the collections framework? Why would you use the ones that come with a language rather than writing your own handcrafted one, right? So there's a, instead of using theirs, you could go and write yourself a map from first principles, right? Why would you use the one that comes with Java writing your own map from first principles? Please put your answers in the chat. Uh, it'd be very interested to hear what you have to say about this. It's a very, very important point. Okay, um, now while I wait for that, um, let's go on to the collection interface. There are basic operators that they all have. These are, think of these as like bags if you want, so it's stuff goes Steve, in them. Steve, yep. You already got several really good responses. Okay, we've got some, yep, go ahead, um, Leo. This one is, um, they've been tested um, before, and another one is they've been optimized to run in the JVM. Um, and 
and another one is uh, because they are good. Yep. That, great answers. So, so Leo just told me what was in the chat that they that they're good, that they've been optimized to run the JVM, and that they've been tested very thoroughly. And that's exactly the right answers. Okay, we use the standard ones because they haven't been tested by two or three people. They've been tested by tens of millions of users, right? Or even a billion users, right? Like Chrome's got a billion users, right? So you've got that many people testing it. It's shaken out all these little corner cases, and they've got really good performance. And if you think, even at the end of your um, ANU computer science degree, you can write a map that performs better and is more robust, has fewer bugs than one that's been tested by millions and millions and millions of people, then you probably shouldn't be getting a, a, be graduating with, a, uh, with an ANU computer science degree. Okay, this is a very important lesson. Weirdly enough, strangely enough, in the second half of the semester, we're going to do exactly what I just told you not to do. We're going to go and write these things from first principles. Why the heck am I doing that? Can anyone guess why we're going to do that? Okay, so for those of you who weren't following me, just put in the chat if you can think why in the second half of the semester we're going to write these things from first principles despite what I just told you and those really excellent answers. For those of you who weren't following what I'm saying, we've got a framework which provides us with these things called collections as maps and sets and lists. That comes from Java. I asked, why should we use the ones that come from Java? And there's some really good answers. And they said, the ones from Java are gonna be robust. The ones from Java are gonna perform well, okay? That's basically the answer. And it's gonna be much better performing and much more robust than anything we could write because uh, so many people have helped make them, okay? That's the, the correct answer. So then the question is, why on earth would I have you go, go and do the exact, exact opposite and implement them from scratch in the second part of the semester? Anyone have anything on the, on the chat, Leo? All right, I'll answer it myself. The answer is, uh, yep, yeah. oh, hang on, we've got one, something. Yep. As, as an exercise, uh, because it will help us better understand the data structures. Perfectly, yeah, a really good answer. Um, there's two dimensions to this. Someone says it's, it's an exercise to help us better understand the data structures, and that's absolutely right, okay? It'll help you understand much better if you've implemented these things yourself. It's a bit like in an advanced computer science, we often get you to implement a compiler. Why would you implement a compiler? It's so you understand how a compiler works. Okay, but, but the other reason for doing the data structure, apart from you learning about data structures, if you implement it yourself, you'll also understand the performance characteristics. You'll understand much better the difference between a tree and a hash, uh, a, a map implemented using a hash and a map implemented using a tree. These are really quite different things. They have the same behavior, but different performance characteristics and different space consumption. And you'll understand that much more deeply if you've actually gone and built one yourself. That's why we want you to have deep understanding, not superficial understanding. That's why we're doing the exact opposite of what I said you should be doing in practice. Okay, so what you do to learn as, a, as an undergraduate is different from what you're going to do if you, if, you, if you end up in a company and someone says go and build this thing, then you should definitely be using the framework. Okay, basic operators, you can ask the size of the thing, that's, that's how many things are in there. You can ask if the thing's empty, you can find out if something is inside of it, you can add something to that container, you can remove something to the container. Remember, think of this thing as a bag or a container, so you can find out how many is in it, whether it's empty, whether it contains something, you can add something to it, you can remove something to it. You can traverse the container, that is you can go through all the stuff in it, say tell me all the things in this list, tell me all the things in this map, tell me all the things in, in, in this set. There are bulk operators uh, for contains, for add, for remove. So you can add a whole bunch of stuff. You can check if all these things are in it. You can remove all these things or you can retain all these things or you can clear everything out of it, okay? They're bulk operators. And there are also array operators that allow you to take an array in Java and convert it into one of these things. The collection types, the primary collection types, and I've mentioned this a lot, we've got sets. Now a set is like a mathematical set. So hopefully you learned this at school. So a set has no duplicates. So if you think about a, a, bowl, a bowl of fruit, if I, um, um, if I add a, um, uh, if I put a banana in my bowl of fruit and then I put another banana, you'd say there's two bananas there, okay? But if it was a set, and, um, and so, say I had a, a banana, an apple, and an orange, and then put another banana, you'd say, okay, there's an apple, an orange, and two bananas. That's what you'd say, right? But if it's a set, you say, um, the set includes banana, the set includes orange, the set includes apple, the set includes banana. The second time you said it, nothing happened. The set still includes banana. There's no concept of how many bananas. It just says, this set includes banana, okay? This set includes apple, this set includes orange. It does not include peach, it does not include pear, okay? So there's this concept of they're either in there or they're not in there. There's no concept of how many, and there's also no concept of order. Okay, there's no concept of there was an apple, then there was an orange, and then there was a banana. No, it's just that the set includes those three things and no, there's no concept of which order they go in, okay? Which is exactly like what you'd expect from a mathematical set. 
A list, on the other hand, is the ordered set of elements. So you could have apple, banana, orange, banana, okay? Then you've got a duplicate. You've got the banana in there twice and you've got a de very deliberate order. Apple, I'm oh, sorry, apple, banana, orange, banana, right? So you've got them in a very particular order, whichever order you put them in. You've got a queue, which is like a list, but it allows you to take things off the front and put them on the back. So but we, don't, we won't focus on queues terribly much in this course, but, uh, but we'll focus mostly on sets, lists, and maps. And a map is a really interesting data structure. We're gonna look at it a lot more soon. Uh, today I mean, um, and a map is something which does, makes a mapping between a key and a value. And so it consists of a set of key value pairs. Okay, a set of key value pairs. The keys of a map form a set, okay? So um, the, the, all the keys are unique. So you could have, um, for example, uh, uh, Steve, yeah, go ahead. There's a question in the chat, is an array a list? Arrays are not lists in Java. An array is um, a fixed size thing. That you, I mean, hopefully you all have at least a bit of a feel for what an array is because you've worked with them a lot. But you have to allocate an array has a fixed size and elements go into different um, uh, indices in the array. A list is more general than an array. You can convert a, a list into an array and an array into a list, but a list can grow and you can do queries over the list. Um, a, an array is a much more primitive um, concept than a list. A list is a bit like an array, but it's much richer, okay? A much richer concept. And we'll go into more detail soon. Each collection type is defined as an interface. So you've got a set interface, a list interface, a queue interface, and a map interface. And you need to choose which concrete kind of set, which concrete kind of list, which concrete kind of queue, which concrete kind of map you use. And your choice will depend on your needs. And that's exactly one of the answers to the question of why do you bother to implement these? Because you'll have a better understanding of how different choices will um, better, better work for different needs. And here's a diagram which, which illustrates this. And you can see that here for sets, you've got a hash set, a tree set, and a linked hash set. The ones in black are the ones that we're gonna focus on um, here. Actually, we, we do a tree set as well in our class, a tree set and a hash set. We've got an array list and link list. Um, um, and we, um, we don't do this and we do do this and we, we do a hash map and we do a tree map. So I'm not quite sure how the coloring, the coloring seems to be messed up, but we do a tree map and a tree set. We do a hash set and a hash map and we do an array list and a link list, okay? So um, this, the coloring has kind of got messed up there. Oh, here it is. Okay, it's very clear here. We've got a hash set, we've got an array list, we've got a hash map, and a link list. These are some of the most common ones you'll, you'll, you'll see. So a hash set implements a set using a hash table. We're gonna study hash tables later in semester. It makes no ordering guarantees. Why, why not? Because sets don't have any concept of order. An array list implements a list using an array, which may help answer the, the question we heard a few moments ago about, about the relationship between arrays and lists. It, um, it has very fast access, but it's got another, another issue which you're gonna understand much more deeply when we go and implement this later in the semester, but that is uh, lists have to grow, but arrays, arrays can't grow. So implementing a list using an array is a little bit annoying. Okay, but it does have very fast access. A hash map implements a map using a hash table and it makes no ordering guarantees and a linked list implements a queue using a linked list. Okay. For each operator, collections implement the for each method which applies to an action every element in the collection. So instead of saying for t, uh, uh, um, for uh, thing t in things, which means for each element t in the set things, do, do something, you can actually say things dot for each and then put a lambda expression there. So if that means for every thing called t, the variable t, do this, okay? It's a lambda, which takes t and uh, then has an action, okay? And so that, that's what the for each method will do. Ordering collections, this is interesting. The comparable interface defines a natural ordering for all instances of this type. Okay, so if you implement the comparable interface for your type, we're gonna see this in, in our coding example very soon. If you implement this interface, then um, it defines the default ordering. The nat says natural, but you can in other words say it's the, def the default ordering for every instance of this type. So you wanna compare two things, it'll order accord according to this. And we'll do a concrete example later. But we can also make our own um, uh, other orderings if we wish. And again, we're gonna, go, we're gonna go and do this. The way they work in terms of their ordering is they return an int, not a boolean saying yes, no, but an int. And if the answer is zero, it means that the two things are the same. If it's negative, it means well, the one comes before the other is positive, it means the, the other way around, okay? And you can see here um, the ordering. It'll become clear when we do an example soon. 
Um, you can sort collections. Um, so uh, if you give it with no arguments, then the collection will be sorted according to the natural or default ordering for that type, right? And again, we're gonna see some concrete examples soon. Or you can give it a single lambda argument, which will use the order defined in the lambda expression, okay? So you, in this example here, you've got a lambda expression, which will take A of type T and B of type T. That's the two things you wanna compare. And then uh, it will return an integer according to whatever order you wanna put A and B in. Okay, so you might say, um, imagine these are two people, you could have a right, right uh, lambda expression here which um, looks at the age of the people and then compares them according to their age, right? So it'll return um, a dot age minus b dot age, for example, and that would just give you an integer, which is the difference between the age of the two people. All right, um, here's a little aside. Um, prefer list to arrays, just generally when you're writing software, it's better to use list than arrays. Um, and the reason here is, um, uh, look, I, I won't go into this, this is more for the 1140 students, it's, it's slightly advanced, but it is kind of interesting. Um, and that is that arrays are what we call covariant, and whereas generics are invariant. And what that means is if um, A extends B, then A is a subclass of B, but list has no relationship to list B. These two things are completely different. Okay, if I've got a list of apples and a list of oranges, they're, they're unrelated. It says, you know, okay, one's a list of oranges and one's a list of apples. They're not related. Whereas um, if you use uh, extends, then, um, then, then A is a subclass of B, which is probably not what we want. And here's an example. Okay, so if we go and make an object array, um, which is the most general type, remember, object is the most general type in Java, and we say, okay, object array is actually an array of longs, okay, Although over here, we've declared it to be an object array and it is an object array, we've assigned it with a long array, okay? Now remember, we can always do this in Java. We can always make this the more general and then assign it with something more specific in, that's a more specific type. So in fact, object array is actually an array of longs, but the code doesn't know that. And what happens here is if you go and assign that, it says, okay, you want to assign to element zero of this object array a string. Sure, let's go do that. And then it says, hang on a minute, this array actually right now is holding along. So you can't do that, okay? And then what happens is your program crashes while it's running. You don't want that, okay? Whereas if you did the same thing using lists, what would happen is it simply wouldn't compile, which is much better. You might wonder, why is it better not to compile? Anyone know? I wanna hear in the chat, does anyone know why it's better for it not to compile? Both of these two things are wrong. This one here will crash when your program is running. This one here simply won't compile, okay? IntelliJ will tell you, nope, you can't do that, okay? And I'll tell you why IntelliJ says it can't do it. It says here, you created a list type object, and then here you've actually assigned it a, 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 a list of longs. And now if you go and do this, it actually knows that this is a list of longs, and um, it won't, uh, sorry, it, it, at this point it, it fails, okay? You cannot do this. This is that line that, that fails. If you try and write this line in IntelliJ, it'll say you can't do that. Okay, does anyone know why, why it's better for to, to fail at compile time than at runtime? This is a really important point, folks. You always want code to fail early. Fail early is a really important idea in, in all computer science. You wanna find out as soon as possible that you just did something stupid, right? We all make mistakes. We make mistakes all the time. Far better to find out sooner rather than later. And it's much, much better for your, your uh, IntelliJ or whatever to say, that's not right, that's wrong, you can't do that. To have that happen, then you just ship the code and then you have a whole lot of customers run this thing and have their whole systems melt down, right? So we always want things to fail at compile time if we can, rather than to fail at runtime if that's the choice, okay? So we wanna know as soon as we can that we did something wrong. That's why using a, a smart IDE like IntelliJ is extremely useful because it has a lot of smart stuff inside of it, far smarter than what you could ever build. Um, yourself and it will tell you right away that you've done something weird or something wrong and that's much better to find out early. All right, there's no mini quiz for that so we're going to move right along to see one unless anyone had a question on any of that stuff. Um, actually, no, uh, no, we're not just going to move on. Hang on, there should be a mini quiz. I just, I've just dropped the slide. Okay, so there is a mini quiz for this. Let's bring up the slide for the mini quiz. Um, here it is. There's definitely a slide for this. Um, and then um, let's go and write some code. We're gonna write code for this, I forgot that. We got code to write. Um, all right, we're gonna do the coding in two parts, folks. Um, we've got two parts for this coding. The first one we're gonna do right now, which is fairly simple. 
And then we're gonna do something much more interesting next Monday, okay? So next Friday, the next lecture is Friday, and that Friday, then we're gonna do the revision lecture. But on Monday, we're gonna go and build a complete solution to Boggle. Okay, we're gonna do a complete solution to Boggle, which usually is a lot of fun. It's a lot, it's quite an interesting, interesting problem, and it demonstrates a whole lot of concepts, including uh, the use of these, these types. So on the J14, the second part of the coding is gonna come up on Monday. But now let's dive into um, some uh, coding, uh, the first part of the coding for J14. And um, here we create a new class here, new Java class, and we're gonna call it, what are we gonna call it, class list. So we're going to, um, oops, uh, j14 dot class list like that. <clears throat> there it is. And what we're going to do is um, we're going to start off by, we're just going to use some stuff that we did before. Um, comp 11.10. There it is. Um, we're going to use, we're going to create an array of these things. Uh, so we'll call it the stew array like that and we'll statically initialize it okay so i'm just going to make an array of comp 1110 students this is really unexciting but i'm just going to grab code from where is it here okay there's one there there's fred okay now i'm just going to grab a bunch of these slap them down here um and um like this and um, what we're going to do is um, manipulate these using the containers that we just talked about. Okay, so this is going to be illustrating those, those Java containers. Now, how many are we going to put in here? I'm going to put in four. I'm just going to put in four here. I'm going to give them all different marks and stuff like that. Not that it really matters terribly much. Fred, uh, Bob, um, Ting. Okay. Well, Call that one Mary, so we've got a gender balance here. All right, okay, so we've got a bunch of people here. We're gonna give them different UIDs. Um, okay, they've all got different UIDs, and they should all have different marks, but I'm not gonna go and manipulate all that now. They've all, they've all got a HD in the exam, that's awesome, but let's, let's give them something a bit more realistic. Um, Okay, and we can imagine they've all got different marks there, but I haven't got around to doing that because it's going to take time. And I know you. Right, let's give them different ages. That that will be useful to give them different ages. It'll come up useful later in uh, in this uh, exercise. Um, let's leave two of them with the same age. I think that might be useful. All right, there we go. Um, so now what we've got got there. Can it, hopefully everyone can see. All I've done here is something very simple. I've created an array. The type of array is a Comp 1110 student. So it's an array of objects, and I've added the objects to the array uh, by creating four objects here, new this, new that, new the other, new, and so, so on. So I've created four Comp 1110 students. They've all got different names, they've all got different UIDs. They've got a range of ages, they're not all completely different. And in theory, all their marks are completely different. Okay, but I haven't typed them all in. All right, so now what we're gonna do is simply go do something which you already know how to do. Um, we're soon gonna have um, Right, so that what I just wrote there is something that you should um, um, okay. So that's pretty straightforward. All I'm doing there is taking this array and and using this syntax in Java to go through all of the elements in the array and sign it to S. So it's going to take every element of the array, put it in S, and go around this loop four times. So let's run this now just to make sure that it's doing what we expect it to do. Uh, here it is. So run it, run that, and let it build. Let's do its thing. And it's a little slow. Okay, so there they all are, right? And you can see there it's just printed them out in exactly the same order because it's simply stepped through the array. Nothing exciting yet. What we're going to do now is we're going to create a list. And someone asked before about the difference between the lists and arrays. We're going to create a list of students rather than an array of students. Luckily, I don't have to type all that stuff in again. I can create a list from that array. So let's do that. We say list, list of Comp 1110 students. Okay, so 
It's a container, it's a list container, and what's in this container? Comp 11, 10 students. Now, if you remember uh, last week, we looked at um, link lists and I wrote an int link list and I wrote a generic link list. That's an example of a generic link list. Here we've got a generic list type, okay? And now you've got this red here and it's IntelliJ is gonna say, which list do you want? Do you want Java util list? That's the standard Java one. And the answer is yes, of course, that's exactly what we want. So do that and it's gonna import the class. And we want that one. All right, done. Okay, so now we've got that. So now we have the, the list that we want. And now, um, what I wanna call it, students, right? Students, right, just guess that, that's nice. Um, equals, and then we say new. Now we have to be concrete. We can't just create a new list. Why can't we create a new list? Um, we can't, so it's IntelliJ's, wah, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, we can't do this, right? Why can't we do that? Because list is an interface type, it is not a concrete type. Let's see if IntelliJ tells us that. Come on, IntelliJ, what's up? Um, split, uh, well, it's giving, it, it, it's, it's confused. But what we can do here is we can make it concrete. Array list, okay? So now we set array list, and now it's got red there because we haven't imported it. It's asking, do we want to import th this? And we say, yeah, sure we do. Okay, now it's, it's pointing out, notice that this is gray, that part there is gray. That's because we don't need to write that because Java can infer that. It knows, it figures out, okay, if you're making an array list and it's gonna be uh, for a, a list of Comp 11, 10 students, then the array, array list is obviously an array list of Comp 11, 10 students. So you can just delete that or you can leave it in there if you want and IntelliJ will just draw it in gray, but we can just get delete, delete that to make it more um, succinct, okay? So now what did I want to do? Um, oh yeah, so now we can do the same sort of thing here. Um, just the same thing, we can just say, for um, comp 11, 10 student S in uh, students. And then um, we go like this and we can just say from uh, list. So now we're plucking out each of the students from that list and printing them out. We can run this, there it is. We can run it there. <clears throat> the next thing, I'm, let, let this do its thing. Oops, what happened there? Why did it not? didn't do anything. Oh, <laughs> why didn't it do anything? Can anyone see why it didn't do anything? This is interesting. That was a very silly bug on my part. Can anyone see, anyone in the chat say what's, what I've done wrong here? I've done something pretty obviously wrong. Uh, in other words, the computer is doing exactly the right thing. It didn't print out anything. It printed, this line didn't get executed. Why did this line not get executed? Anyone? This line didn't get executed. Yeah, go ahead. It's just uh, empty list. That's because the list is empty. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. Look here. I've said make yourself a list. So it said, yep, here's a list. It's empty. And then I said print out everything in the list. It's like, well, there's nothing in there. So it didn't execute anything, right? That's why nothing got printed out. So what we can do though, is we can pass the constructor a list created from an array. So you can just do this. You can say arrays, arrays dot as list and then pass it the stew, the stew array, okay? And so what that's doing is it's constructing um, this uh, from um, uh, the stew array. So it's gonna take this array here and convert it into, a, an, into an array list. Now let's run it and we should get something more sensible. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do, hopefully this will work. There we are, and it worked, all right? Now, the next thing we're gonna do, by the way, the ordering of this is not guaranteed at all. It happens to be the same, but it need not be, okay? It could be anything. All right, now, what we're gonna do now is create a map. Do you remember what a map is? A mapping is a mapping between a key and a value, okay? It's a bit like, um, what's an example of a key and a value mapping? Uh, it's like the key is how you look the thing up and the value is the thing you're looking up. So for example, um, you see it all the time when you go to a grocery store, for example. Um, every item has a barcode that then there's a, some record on some computer that says, oh, that item? Yeah, it's on sale today, it's this price. Or that item? Oh, it costs this amount per kilo. Oh, that item? That is a mapping from that barcode number to all the information you need about that product, okay? In that case, the key is the barcode number. The value is the, all the data about the, the ice cream you just bought or the, 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 the apple that you're about to buy, okay? So every item has associated with an ID, 
either on a barcode or, or, or a product ID. And then there's a mapping from that thing, which we call a key, to all the information that we want about that. Okay, so in that context, if you understood that basic idea, that's called a map, right? So a map takes a key, which is a unique set, okay? So we don't have duplicates. There's not duplicates of the same product ID. That doesn't make any sense. There can't be two products with the same ID. If they have the same ID, by definition, it's the same product, okay? That's a very important idea, a very simple idea, okay? So the keys are all unique, right? Um, so then, um, how would we? What might we do for the students? What we can't use their names as keys because there's loads of people with the same name. If you look at our class, which has got like 450 students in it, you'll see there are multiple students with the same name, right? So we can't use their names as keys. What could we use as the keys? And I, ideally, it's something that doesn't change, right? So using their marks would also be really bad. Not only will be this, there be students with the same marks, but the, the student marks are changing all the time. So that's gonna be pretty crazy, right? So we don't wanna do that either. What can we do, what, what do we have here which identifies the student in a way that's not changing and it's unique for every student? What could that be? Anyone? People suggest a uni ID. UID, great thinking folks. So what we're gonna do now is gonna make a, a, a map between um, UIDs and, um, and, um, and, and the students. Okay, so we're gonna do, uh, yeah, so we're gonna create a map. And what's the type of a UID here? Okay, here it's a string. We're just using a string to represent it. Okay, so we're gonna do something like this. We're gonna say something like this. We're gonna say map, map, um, string. That's the key. And the string is the UID, because it's a type string, to a Comp 1110 student. Like that. Okay, that's the mapping. And it's gonna ask us to import it. And we'll say, sure, go ahead. And we want Java Util map. Okay, so we're creating a map and we're gonna call that what we're gonna call it. I've got some notes here. We're gonna call it UID map, how original. UID map equals uh, new hash map. Okay, so we created a hash map of, um, of students. Okay, hash map is a concrete map. Map is an interface. I explained that in the lecture notes a, few, a short while ago. So map is an interface type. It represents all different kinds of map. A hash map is a concrete type. Again, we don't put the generic type in here because we don't need to because IntelliJ can figure out its string Comp 1110 student. We could write this, this stuff in here. When I say IntelliJ, the compiler, the Java compiler figures that out. Let's just pop this in here. And that's completely correct but useless. It's just a waste of space to put that in there and it writes it in gray. We can just delete that, okay? So we don't need that there. So now what we're gonna do is put all this stuff in the map, okay? So how would we do that? Well, there are lots of ways to do that, but we can just do it like this. Just grab that code there. We can just go through the, um, go through the stew array and then we can just say um, UID map and then we can say put, which is the way you add something. Then the key, what's the key gonna be? It's gonna be student.uid um, and then we're gonna put in the student, okay? So what that does is say, add to our map um, a key, which is the student ID, and a value, which is a whole student. So we now we've got a map which has all of these um, keys, which are the UIDs, which are strings, and all of the students, okay? So we've got a mapping of all these students. And then what we can do is we can go through all of the values, we can look them up, okay? Yeah, let's go look them up. So we can do something like this, we say string, key equals, um, and we'll just cut and paste one of these things. We can make up other ones if you want, but uh, we'll just do that like that. And then we'll say, um, uh, what do I wanna do here? I'm gonna look, for, yeah, okay, we'll just do this. We'll do comp 1110 student um, value equals, um, what do we call it, UID map? UID map dot get key, okay? So what that's gonna do is gonna go into that map using this key and pull out the value, which is a student. So it should be, which, which one was it? Is this one here? So it should pull out Ting. And then we can say, um, it's out. Um, uh, what do we wanna say? Say from uh, found like that, and, and then we can say value. Okay, so run this, and what should happen is we've populated the map with all these students. We then looked one up using a key, and then it should say that it found the one. So it's found Ting, which is exactly the right one because that's the one which has that UID and it's found that, um, that one. And don't forget, how did it print out the value? It's because we wrote a two string method a few classes ago for Comp 1110 student. That's so when, it, when we say this, it turns that into a string, turns the value into a string and um, we get this message down here. What we're gonna do now, what are we gonna do now? Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna say, um, we're gonna go through all of the values. You can dump the contents of the map. So let's just do something similar here. Um, something like this, same sort of thing. 
what you can do here is you can say for um, UID map dot values. Yeah, like that. Okay, so what that's gonna do is go take all of the values in that map and return them one after the other. And the ordering, who knows what the ordering is, right? So let's run that, and the ordering could be anything. Oops. Run this again. And now what we're gonna do, what are we gonna do next? Okay, so we've got them from the map. Notice that the ordering is quite different here. It's in Ting, then VJ, then Fred, then Mary, right? So it's kind of quite different to the ordering up here. So it's going Ting, then VJ, then Fred, then Mary, right? So it, the ordering is undefined. We have no particular ordering there, which is the important thing to notice. And then what we can do is we can do, um, let's create a new student, see what happens if we add a new student in there. Okay, so let's add a new student like this, right? Like this, um, so we'll say, uh, Comp 1110 student Sue equals new Comp 1110 student Sue and um, and then we give them some other mark like that. So now we've got a new student called Sue and we're going to add them to the map. What happened? Hey, yep. Here we have a really good question from. Uh, Michael, is there a is there an interface that allows objects to be iterable for in a for loop like that? Is there an interface that allows objects to be iterable to iterate through the objects? Well, here you've got a values thing which returns all of the values. That's an interface that allows you to iterate through the values in a for loop. I'm not sure I'm I'm getting the question. What's the question here? Is there, a, is there an interface that allows objects to be iterable in a for loop, like um, the for loop you're currently using? Uh, so, like order the... Oh, to order them? To, well, this is iterable. We're iterating through them here. This is an iteration here. Okay, so we're iterating them here. So you want to be able to order them? Absolutely, we can order them. We're going to do that soon. All right. In terms of ordering, yes, um, we're going to get to that in a short while. But here, this is an iteration. This is literally an iteration of the values in that map. Okay, um, and we can we can change the ordering in different ways shortly. So we'll, we'll come to that soon. All right. Good question. If I understood it right. Um, okay. So now we've got a new person called Sue, and we're going to add them to the map. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to say UID map dot um, put, and then we'll, we'll do the UID Okay, and then we'll just say we added Sue and then, then, then we'll go through them all again. Okay, so like this and we'll run this, okay? And see what happens. We should have five things in the map, right? Aha, but we don't. What happened? Does anyone, anyone in the chat know what happened here? Something went wrong. What went wrong? Look, there's only four things after we added Sue. What happened? We lost VJ and got Sue instead. Why is that? Can anyone see? typed in the wrong ID. Exactly. Whoops. <laughs> I did that on purpose so that we could see the behavior. But notice that, folks. That's a very, someone said I typed in the wrong UID, and that's exactly right. And I did that deliberately to make the point. This here is the UID for VJ. So I made the mapping between VJ's key and Sue. That's, and that, what that does is it replaces VJ's object with Sue's object using the same key, Okay, which is not what we want. So let's fix that key up, and now we'll have um, we should have five things in the set. That should illustrate to you very clearly the concept that the set of keys is unique. I can't have two students with the same key. Uh, so if I go and put something with the same key as something that's already there, it simply replaces it. So we have the effect of replacing VJ with Sue. And now I've fixed Sue's, Sue's UID up, and it's this, and it should be better. In fact, there's a better way to do this. Okay, so now we've got all five of them, right? So we've got VJ back. But what we can do is this. We can say Sue.getUID. If I'd done it that way, I wouldn't have made the mistake. All right, so I'm actually getting the UID from Sue, and then you can be really sure that it's going to work. All right, um, and I, maybe this is getting to what um, what this uh, Michael was asking on the chat. Um, so 
Now, we can also add, um, we can also add Sue to the list of students. So we can say um, students, which is a list, right? Students.add Sue. So now Sue's also added to that list. Here we added her to the map. Now adding her to the, to the, to the that was the map of UIDs to students. Now we've also got a list of students, so Sue's now there. What we can do now is we can sort the list of students. So we can say um, collections, collections.sort. Um, oh, collections with the plural, dot sort. And then um, we can sort students. There we go. So what that's gonna do is sort that list of students. And why have I got a problem here? Oh, easy. What's the problem here is that there's no, um, so it, okay, this is a slightly obscure error message, but the key word is we haven't implemented, the key thing here is we have not implemented the comparable interface for student, okay? So for this to work, students have to implement the comparable interface, which may be partly answering Mike, Michael's question. And so we have to go here and say, okay, here's our student. In fact, what we can do is we can add it to person because that's more general than student. So we can make all of our people, whether they be Comp 11, 10 students or just students or people, we can make them comparable. And we just do this, we say implements, and we say comparable, like that. And um, comparable person, like that. Right, lots of red ink. What's the problem? Well, we have to implement the missing methods, right? So we say implement the methods. Okay, there we go. And now we've got the compare to thing, which says compare this person to that other one. We often write the word other here, O or other. Okay, so compare us to another one. And we can do something very, very simple, like compare them by age. So we can say um, return um, uh, other dot age minus age. Right, or we can do it the other way around. We can, yeah, let's do it the other way around. Okay, so we will we'll take the difference between our age and the other one's age, like that. Okay, now we go back to where we were in the class list, and we're all happy because now our students implements that interface. We can go and make that that implementation of the sorting fancier in a minute. But now what happens is that type person and everything that inherits from it, like Comp 11, 10 student is sortable, naturally sortable. So when we say sort, it goes, yep, I know how to do that because that type there, your, your students list, is a list of things which are sortable because they implement that, um, that interface. Okay, so now what we can do is we, they're now sorted, so we can say, uh, where is our list stuff? We're up here, um, like this. And go like that, and we can say, um, And we can say uh, something like um, all students in natural in natural order, and then we're going to go through that list of students and um, just like that from sorted list. Type the word sorted in here, and now what we should see when we run it is that they're sorted according to their age. Okay, there there you go, and you can see that. Um, we had lots of people aged 19. We could have changed Sue's age here to um, um, 21, just to make it more different. And same thing, like that. And then we can go and make the sorting slightly more advanced so that we get, uh, okay. So we've got Fred and Vijay, and we can change the ordering of that to be slightly cleverer. And we can say that, something like this, we can say if um, age, age equals other.age, meaning these two things are the same age, then return um, uh, something like um, name, their name, they've got, we, we, compared to name, other.name, right? So now, they're, now they're, the secondary sort, if you like, is on the name. So if they've got the same age, then we'll, then we'll sort them by, by name, all right? And we run that, um, and we've changed our sorting order. And in fact, I think it was by chance doing it by um, name anyway. Just, oh, hey Steve. Um, yeah, another question? A question from Joshua. Um, can you please explain how exactly the difference of ages makes the people sorted by age? Yep, okay. Um, because the way the comparisons work is it wants us to simply order things. 
All right, it just wants us to place an order. Say, does this thing come before that thing? And the way we do that is giving it a number where zero means they're the same, negative number means this one comes before that one, and a positive number means this one comes before that one. Okay, so we've just got to, and the way, the way Java does it is by returning an int. So it only really cares if it's zero, meaning these two things are the same, if it's a positive number or a negative number, which tells it which way around these two things go. Okay, so that's a simple way of, uh, you could use a Boolean, except Boolean can't take care of the three cases. There are actually three cases, right? This one's smaller, this one's larger, and they're both the same. So you need three. So that's why we don't use a Boolean. Otherwise, we might have used a Boolean for this, okay? When I say we, the Java interface might have used a Boolean. So it just wants an int, which is going to take on three values, either zero, a negative number, or a positive number. And it doesn't actually care which positive number or which negative number. It just wants positive number, negative number, zero. So it's really just three things. And um, <clears throat> that's how this works. So just by doing a subtraction, if those two things were the same, they'd equal zero, which would mean that they're the same. Um, if, if one's higher, then it will sort it one way. If one's low, it will sort it the other way. Okay? Hopefully that answers that. And we're nearly done here with this. We've still got a bit of, bit of work to do, so let me keep moving on. Um, <clears throat> where were we? What did I want to do here? Got a few more steps I wanted to go. Yeah, now we're going to use lambdas to finish off the sorting. Okay, so we've sorted using the natural ordering. Now what we can do is we can say, um, yeah, so we can now sort them according. So we, you, here we've said collections.sort students that way. What we can also do is say collections, collections, collections dot sort students, and then we can provide a lambda for this for the sorting expression. So you can do something like this. You can say, um, oops, students. The lambda will take two students, comp1110 student um, S1, comma, comp1110 student S2. So the two students we're going to compare, right? And then we're going to um, return a function um, which orders them somehow. So we can, we can what's, a, what's a good way to compare them? What's another way to compare them that we can do with students that we can't do with people? Right, we did the people, we did it by age, we did it by name. One thing we could do with, it, with the students is, is sort them by UID, right? We could sort them by UID because every student has a UID. So we can do that, we can just, and that's easy to do. We just say return um, s1.getUID.compare um, to s2.uid. Oops, get UID, like that, all right? So now we've got ourselves a, uh, what's happened here, what have I done wrong? There. Need to, there we go. All right. So now we've gone and sorted it. Um, I'm not sure why it's done that in gray. It's slightly disconcerting. So we've written ourselves a lambda, which will take two students and we'll sort them according to the UID. So now let's do this. Just cut and paste this stuff here and say, um, and let's run it. <clears throat> and hopefully this will work just fine because. Uh, why is that? It's worked, it's worked exactly correctly. Um, you'll see that it's not done it by age, it's done it by UID, which just so happens to be the order I added. You might think, oh, well, that's a cheat. Let's just change that UID there to be 50 so that it, to double check that this is correct. So we'll change that one to 50. And now Sue should come first if we've done this right. Yeah, and now Sue is first because I changed her UID to be lower than all the others and it's done exactly what we, we, we wanted. I am still slightly perplexed by that gray text there from IntelliJ. I don't know why it's done that. Um, and now, well, the other thing we can do, yeah, I just want to show you one more example here. You can do something like, um, you can get their marks, right? Get mark. Mark, is that right? Oh, not get mark, it's just mark. Like that, okay. Um, and subtract the other one's mark, s2.mark. Right, so now it will compare the two marks and sort them according to the um, in mark order. Okay, run this. And we'll see them listed according to the order of the marks. And there they are. All right, so we've got the lowest one first and they gradually increase. All right, so with that, um, perfect. We're done. So um, we're done with this, 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 this chunk. 
on the next Monday, we're going to go to the next level to J14 and implement all of Boggle using collection types, which is a fun thing to do. And it also shows how we do uh, a search problem, which is a, a fun thing to do also. Now, now we get on to recursion. Many of you, some of you, will have studied recursion at school or uh, in another class, but we're going to do it from first principles here because we have no prerequisites for this class, and so I'm not assuming anyone has done recursion before. Um, so here, this is recursion. This is all you need to know about recursion. <laughs> I'm sure some of you have seen something like this before. If you've ever been to a big sporting event, you may have seen a situation where they show the camera on the scoreboard, and the scoreboard um, shows the... Um, um, the photo of the scoreboard, which shows a photograph of the scoreboard and so forth. And that's a picture of a picture of a picture. And here, um, and this is uh, from a, a Dutch cocoa packet, which I actually had some of this stuff. And you can see here in the packet, that's the picture on the packet. And if you look in the picture, in the picture, there's a picture of the packet, which has a picture of the packet. And if you look really close, there's a picture of the packet and the picture of the packet. So the, the, you've got the same, same thing. Um, another example here, you see it in nature. So what's actually going on here, you've got these big giant cone things here. And then here you'll see these giant cone things here. And those giant cone things there are actually composed of these little cone things there and so forth. And you get this, this, um, this recursive structure. So <clears throat> in computer science, we can have recursive data structures. And I actually mentioned this um, uh, last week, I think it was, when we did the linked list, and I pointed out that a linked list is a recursive data structure. Why is it a recursive data structure? Because the linked list node points to a linked list node. Okay, just like the packet of cocoa has a picture of a packet of cocoa. All right, so the linked list node refers to a linked list node. That's called a recursive data structure. And so um, a recursive data structure is, is comprised of components that reference other components of the same type. And so that's, these things here are linked list nodes and they refer to linked list nodes. These things here are tree nodes and they refer to tree nodes. So the recursive data types. Recursive algorithm is a, an algorithm that references it's, itself, okay? So it's an algorithm that references itself. A recursive al algorithm is comprised of one or, one or more base cases and a remainder that reduces to the base case, okay? This will be explained more clearly um, soon. But the base, basic thing is you, you find out the simplest base case, you write those ones down, and then you write the general case in terms of the general case, which ultimately reduces down to the base case. We'll see it in more, more clarity here. Okay, so in the example, we've got a mathematical sequence called a Fibonacci sequence. And we've got two base cases. The Fibonacci sequence for zero is one. The Fibonacci sequence for one is one. And for all other values, the Fibonacci sequence is, for, for any other value n, is the Fibonacci sequence of the um, n minus one plus the Fibonacci sequence for n minus two. Okay, notice this here is a recursive definition of Fibonacci and these things here are the base cases. Okay, this is a, this is a Fibonacci sequence is expressed recursively. Okay, so again, this here is an expression of the Fibonacci sequence and it's expressed in terms of the Fibonacci sequence. And if you take some number like four, you'll find out the Fibonacci sequence for four is equal to the Fibonacci sequence for three, four minus one, plus the Fibonacci sequence for two. Okay, and the Fibonacci sequence for three is equal to the Fibonacci sequence for two plus the Fibonacci sequence for one. Fibonacci sequence for one is one. Fibonacci sequence for two is um, uh, these two together, so, and so forth, and you can add them all up. And you can illustrate this here, like that, like that, like that, like that, okay? And this actually occurs in nature, which is really cool. So you get things like a Nautilus shell, which, um, um, it exhibits um, recursive um, structures inside of it and naturally. And you, see, you, you can also see it in things like ferns or in those other uh, that photograph I showed you earlier. Merge sort is a great example and we're gonna implement, if we have time, we're gonna implement merge sort today. I'm gonna try and plow through this. So if you need to leave at five, again, I'm just gonna plow on through um, so we get all this stuff done, we don't fall behind. Uh, <clears throat> so the merge sort here, and you can watch the recording um, later if you if you like. So merge sort allows us to sort a list. And, and, and some people find recursion hard, but you shouldn't, okay? It requires just one neat trick. The one neat trick is you suspend disbelief when you're building it, you suspend disbelief and imagine that you've already built it. 
then it becomes easy because you can use it in your solution. Say, imagine I already have a sorting algorithm, then I can build my sorting algorithm more easily, okay? Which is a weird thing to do, but that's how you build a recursive algorithm. So you say, okay, I'm gonna build my, al my sorting algorithm on the assumption that I have a sorting algor algorithm that works for smaller things than what I currently have. And that's what we do here. And so um, the insight of von Neumann, this is von Neumann, and he invented this back in 1945, okay? And we've, we've done the bio on von, von Neumann already, and you, should, you all should know who von Neumann is by now. He's one of our bios, and uh, definitely someone every computer science student should know of. Um, he makes the very obvious observation that if I have a list with one thing in it, it's already sorted, right? That, it seems like a completely obvious thing to say, but that's a, that's a really crucial insight. The list of size one is already sorted, okay? And then um, notice that sorting a list of two is, is really easy because it's either a swap that way or a swap that way, okay? And then what he says is actually, you know what? For any size list, I can split them in two and I can take two sorted lists and merge them together. So if this list is sorted and this list is sorted, then I can just slide them into place like that and produce a, a fully sorted list which is really cool, okay? So if you can understand that if I have a sorted list here and a sorted list here, I can push them together by moving this one here until it fits into the right place here, moving this one here until it fits the right place here, moving those ones there, and I end up with a fully sorted list, okay? That is the key inside of merge sort. Let's go through a concrete example. You can see that one there, uh, that the, it's an unsorted list there with a bunch of numbers in it. And then, um, and then here we split it into two and I gave you an example which is uneven, but it, it makes it more, even more elegant when, when it's a power of two. And you can see you, you've got a thing on the left and a thing on the right, they're both unsorted. So you apply merge sort to those each half. You say, okay, I've got this unsorted list. Let's split it in half and then sort each half. Okay, so, so you say, okay, let's sort this. How are we gonna sort it? Oh, we're gonna use merge sort. Weird, because we haven't actually defined what merge sort yet, but let's just do that anyway. Okay, then we say, okay, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take this list here, which is unsorted, and we're gonna sort it. How are we gonna do it? Oh, we're gonna use merge sort. We we'll split it in half, here and here, and we're gonna sort them using merge sort. That's weird. Okay, and then you do the same thing again, and ultimately you end up having these single element lists. And then you go, oh, that's right, if the list is of size one, it's already sorted, we're done. Okay, then all you need to do is to merge them together. And you say, okay, I've got these two things here, let's merge them together. That's easy, everyone knows how to merge these two single things. Likewise here, it's really easy to merge them and so forth. So it becomes really easy to get to this step. And then what you do is you say, okay, I've got this thing that's all in order, and that thing that's all in order, it becomes really easy to make this that's also all in order, okay? Same here, and ultimately you produce this, okay? So basically what we do is we take our original list and say, the way we're gonna do merge sort is bust it in half, and sort each half and then merge them together. How do we sort them? With merge sort, okay? So, the, so let's just run that again. We're gonna take this thing here, bust it in half, which is what we've done here, sort this, which is all that stuff, so now it's sorted, and sort this, which is all that stuff, now it's sorted. Once we've got the two things sorted, we merge them together, okay? Like this, and we end up with a sorted list. Um, and here's a lovely visualization of a whole lot of sticks which are unsorted and we're gradually sorting them by busting, them in, busting the list in half and sorting the two halves. And you can see this really nice pattern developing as all, all these sticks gradually become sorted. Now you've got four and now you've got two and the next step those two will get sorted into one big long sorted list. Okay, that's an illustration of merge sort. Mini quiz. Where are we here? And we've got a second mini quiz for J14. I've forgotten why we have that, but we've got an extra one for J14. For... Oops, no, that one's not working. It's all right, all good there. Then what we're gonna do now is launch into some code again. And we're gonna do a very simple program first in this C module. Um, if I can just wake up my notes here. Yeah, so what we're gonna do is we're going to um, do something very, very simple. One thing that's naturally recursive is the um, relationship from child to parent, okay? So um, every uh, child has a parent by definition, 
of any species, right? So every child, unless it came out of a test tube, has a parent, and their parent has a parent, and their parent has a parent, and their parent, and so forth, right? So there's a recursive relationship, a child-parent relationship. And um, what we can do here is we'll create this little class here, and um, then, um, and I just realized I did that test-driven development one unit out of order. I should have done it after the stuff I'm doing right now because we're going to start using it shortly, but not just yet. Okay, the test-driven development stuff. Um, I didn't quite get that right. So we're going to create a code here. And we're going to call it maternal line. Okay, and we're going to write a recursive class which does um, um, recursively prints out um, the uh, maternal line um, in four. Okay, so what we're going to do here, uh, so it'll become clearer, clearer in a minute. So it'd be the nth maternal ancestor. So your mother is your uh, first maternal ancestor. Your grandmother is your second maternal ancestor. Your mother's mother's mother is your third and so forth, right? So, um, so we're, we're, and we can solve this iteratively, but we're going to solve it recursively here. So we say static string, and we're going to call it maternal ancestor, ancestor, and we'll take it to the nth. So it'll be the nth maternal in ancestor, right? So again, your first maternal ancestor um, is going to be, what's happened here? Why is this, what's going on here? Um, if, and hang on, what, what's going on? I'm not sure what IntelliJ is complaining about here. What did I do wrong here? It's not helping me. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to break this down into the two cases. Just like I said, what's the base case? The base case is the case of one, where n is one, which is your mother. Your, nth, your, your first maternal ancestor is your mother. Okay, so what we'll say is we'll say if n equals one, we'll return a string which says um, mother. Like that. Okay, something's unhappy. I've done something really dumb here. What is it? Oh, I've put it inside the main method. What am I doing? Um, that's the problem. <laughs> All right, so that's why everything was so upset at me um, is I was putting this in the wrong place. Okay, so there we go. Um, but if n is not equal to one, so what's the nth maternal ancestor? Okay, how can I express this in terms of the algorithm itself? Well, you can do this. You can say return that our nth maternal ancestor is our mother's n minus one maternal ancestor, right? Our mother's one level up in the, 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 um, um, the tree. So I can say this, maternal, right? So what that says is that if n is one, then that's who my maternal ancestor, it's my mother. But if n is greater than one, I can find out who it is by saying that person the, say the, the second or third, is equal to my mother's maternal answer of, ancestor of one less, right? That's the relationship to my mother is one less than the relationship to me. So I can express the definition of the maternal ancestor for myself in terms of my mother, which is one up minus with n minus one, all right? So then I can just, just, just input, I can just write a very simple program here. I can say, um, Um, like that, and then um, we can just do um, like that, uh, and we'll get it from system.in. This will allow us to pull something in, and then we'll just grab the um, while in dot has next. Um, int, we're going to bring, read in ints, um, then we'll, so just as long as there's something there, we'll say int n equals um, in dot next int, like that. So we're going to read in the integers that come from the command line. And then what we'll do is we'll say s out your um, n degree mother is your and then we'll say um, maternal ancestor n. 
we'll call maternal ancestor to get the string. And then just to, so it prompts us again, we'll just type this, this line of code here again. Let's run this. Okay, so let's be clear what this is doing. It's gonna print that out, then it's gonna read in a number from the keyboard, and then it will um, uh, take in that, turn that into an int n, and then it will call maternal ancestor n, and so forth. So let's just try this out, okay? Run it. Um, run maternal line. And we're gonna type it in, we'll say one. And your first degree mother is your mother. Okay, that's obvious, that's what, that's what you expect. Okay, now we'll type in another number, we'll type in two, right, which should be our mother's mother, right? And there you are, it's your mother's mother. And then you type in uh, five, and your fifth degree mother is your mother's 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 mother. mother. Okay, and so forth. But what we have here is a recursive algorithm. Our base case is for when n equals one. We know that our first maternal ancestor is our mother. And then all other cases, we can say, well, that ancestor is, my, is, is the same as my mother's ancestor of n minus one. Okay, and so we define it that way. So we just say, find out what my mother's ancestor is and say, this is my mother's, and then say what that was, okay? And we get this, this is your mother's mother's mother and so forth. All right, and so when it's two, let's just step through it for two, just to be, so everyone's really clear on this. So if n equals two, we read in two here, we call eternal ancestor with two, we go up to here and we say uh, n is two, if n equals one, no, it's not one. We say it's our mother's, and then we say it's our mother's, and then we, we take one off of two, which is one, and we call this again. And we go in here and we say, oh, um, what's the maternal ancestor of level one? It's your mother, okay? So then we, the, the string we return is, it's our mother's mother. And that's why it says here that the, your second degree mother is your mother's mother. And that's it for that one. What we're gonna do now is um, get started on um, the next cool thing, which is merge sort. I'm gonna see how far we get here before it gets to uh, the hour. Um, and play it by ear according to how, how much how much I get done. Um, so we're gonna write a class here which is called um, merge sort. <clears throat> and we'll add it to git. And what we're gonna do now is we're going to write the test first, okay? So we say at test, there we go, and we're gonna add in this test, and we'll say public, public void um, sort test. Like that, so we've written ourselves a method which is a sort test. Now we've got to write stuff in here which is gonna find out if our function, which we haven't written yet, is actually gonna work. So let's, we actually have to write our interface here. We'll write that up here. We'll say, um, like this, we'll say um, public static list integer. We'll, we'll take in a, a list of integers. So we'll say public um, static uh, list of integer. So it's gonna return a list of integers and it will take um, merge sort and it will take um, an unsorted list. Um, like that, okay, and then in a minute we'll write that, we'll just return null for now. Okay, so actually we'll just return the same thing. That's a good idea. We'll just return the unsorted one, right? So this is a bad sort because it actually doesn't do anything. All right, so notice what, so let's just finish this off. We'll import the right thing. So we're importing the, the correct class, Java util list. Okay, so we've written ourselves a very silly sort, which all it does is it takes in an unsorted list and returns that same list. Clearly, that's not correct. So our test should fail, right? So we haven't really implemented, just like in your assignments when we return a, a default value. Here we're returning the unsorted list, which we know is not what we want. So now, uh, we'll fix this soon. Right? So now what we're gonna do is write some code to do a test. We'll say integer, and we'll make ourselves some simple lists, okay? The first thing we should do is make sure our code can sort a, correctly sort a, um, a single, a list of size one, right? So we'll say um, single equals like that. So we've created a, a, a list 
of size one. And then we can do something like this. We can say assert true, assert true. Um, and we've got to check that what we've got is equal to the sorted one. Okay, so we'll, we'll just say, we'll say assert true, we'll say um, single dot equals, well, actually we can say assert equals, here's the right way to do it, equals. And it will want us to import that, which is what we want to do. Import the static method, yep. There we are. So we assert equals, we're going to check if single, actually if, um, Okay, we can write that. So now what we're doing is we're taking this thing here. Oh, we've got to convert that into a, um, um, the unsorted equals um, arrays um, as list single like that. So we've got an unsorted thing here and a sorted thing here. And we're going to take um, merge sort of the unsorted thing. And we're going to say that we need the, um, the, in this case, we've got a list of size one, the unsorted and the sorted should be the same. So we'll say assert equals that the, that the sorted thing is equal to the unsorted thing. And then we'll say, um, we've got to write an error message. Say um, not sorted. Right, um, and so this very, very simple test will tell us if, um, in fact, why don't we just return null? That's a much better idea. Let's just start off with null to start with, like this, because otherwise that test is gonna pass. Let's just run this test now. The way we can run the test is by pressing Control, right click here, say run sort test. This should now run this little test here. It's running it. There we go, and it failed, okay? And so it did not sort list of size one. Expected, no, oops, wrong way around. Expected an actual, I got them the wrong way around. Let's flip them the other way around, and we'll say try it again, because notice down here it said the expected was null and the actual was eight. It should be the other way around. We expected eight and the actual was null. Oops, there it is there. So expected eight and it got null. All right, good. We failed, which is exactly what we want when we start. Remember, the test-driven development says we should get a fail when we start off. Now let's write um, an, uh, a larger one. In fact, what we can do here, I think, let's see if we can do this. Um, no, I can't do that. Um, we'll just do it like this and then um, I'll change this, unsorted. Just write this out longhand. I'm just going to use a slightly nicer notation here. And then I will say um, unsorted here. I think I can do this, unsorted. I'm not sure if I can. Let's just see this. No, you can't. You've got to make a new one. All right. Sorry, folks. Just bear with me. I'm just trying to improve my code as I go and I'm making mistakes. So what we're going to do here is we'll do u uh, multiple, meaning unsorted multi. Okay, and we'll just write a bunch of numbers here. All right, so that, that, that's, that's an unsorted list of uh, um, multiple length. And then we'll do the same thing here. And we'll call this one sorted multi. Right, and now we just put these in order. So the three goes to the front and um, the eight, eight has to move like that. Is that right? Okay, I think it's all sorted. Okay, there we are. And then what we can do is the same sort of thing. Oops, get, there's an extra comma there. Oops, oh my goodness, I right, get save that paste this here, and then we'll say, um, 
oh, same sort of thing as this. I've got to say um, u equals u equals arrays as list as list u multi. There we go. So now we've made ourselves a list which is the same as the has got the contents of that. And now we'll say um, s equals arrays dot as list um, s multi. So it's a sorted one. And then um, and two, four, six elements of size six. Okay, and then we'll say it did not sort something of size six. Let's just see what happens here. And it says that one, we know that one's gonna fail. Let's just get rid of that. Let's, let's just fix that bug. We can easily fix that by returning the unsorted one. Okay, we'll fix the, the first fail and see if we can make the second fail visible. Let's just do that. So we've got two tests in here, that assertion there and this assertion here. And let's see if we can get past that first one. Yes, we got past the first one. And, um, and it said that it expected that, but it got that. I've done it the wrong way around again, haven't I? Um, it should be S and then U, is that right? Expected. Hmm. Should be S and then U. That is sorted. Okay, um, let's run that again. Must have got this one wrong, wrong as well. I'm not sure how I messed that up. So S and then U. I've got these two things in the wrong way around. There we are. And one more thing. Um, I made a mistake here. Another mistake I've made here is that I should really do these as separate methods. So let's just duplicate this here and change their names. We'll call this sort single. And we'll call this one sort multi. There's a very important rule that says try and make each test um, separate. Um, and we'll do this here. And put this in here. Oh, I, I see here I've made a mistake. Um, that's why it was wrong. Hang on, I've, I've messed all this up. I should have done this, right? Um, there we go. There was a mistake in my code before. It should have, I should have used merge sort. The sorted one is not equal to this, but equal to that. I, I do have this back to front. No wonder I was confused before. It should be like this. And the reason for it is that I was, I, that, that mistake I made there. So I had here that S is equal to um, that sorted array up there. But in fact, it should be uh, this one here here, um, oh, right, oh, I see, I see, I see the problem here, um, I've gotten the names wrong here, unsorted is like that, ah, I see the problem here, so what we want, um, we need, we actually want a value called expected, okay, so expected is going to be this guy, we need multiple values here, folks. I've, I've made a mistake here. This should be expected, not sorted. Well, we can call it expected. And then we can have another thing here called, um, here, let's just sort, clean this up. I'm sorry, folks. Expected is gonna be, the, is gonna be um, arrays as list um, sorted multi, right? So that's expected. And then we say um, uh, that, that we, um, and in fact, we should change the name of this. Oh, we can call it S, okay, so E, and S, so there we go. E multi is not being used, it should be here. Um, e multi, like that, okay, that's good. And then we've got to fix this here up, the same problem. Um, it turns out that the result's gonna be, the expect, in this case, in this particular case here, the expected and the sorted are, are gonna be the same. But here, there's a difference between um, the expected and the, um, let's just see here, hang on a second. Let's run this. Oops, no test found. We're gonna run this test here. And 
let's see if it's doing what we expect. All right. Yeah, now it's working as we expect. Okay, so what's happened here is the expected one is uh, E, which is E multi, which is the expected outcome, right? And, um, and then the, what, what we actually got was this sorted one, which is the unsorted thing that's gone through merge sort, and we actually got that because it didn't do anything, all right? And if we go to the single test, we turn this back to null, and we try and run this test, run single sort single test, it should, this one here should behave correctly now. Let's just run it. There it goes. Okay, we expected to see eight and we actually got null. Okay, so the expected is eight, which happens to be this. And what we actually got was a merge sort of that, which turned out to be null. All right, I think at this point, folks, it's, it's just about the hour. I'm gonna finish up at this stage and we'll finish the rest of merge sort in our next lecture. It shouldn't take me very long. I don't want to keep you longer than necessary. So let's now flip on to the bio today. And our biography for today is Fran Allen. Fran, oops, um, this slide is actually out of date. She died, I believe, in um, uh, a year ago, two, uh, two years ago. So she died quite recently. Fran Allen passed away recently, I believe. Um, and uh, Fran Allen was uh, one of the founding people for um, optimizing compilers. Optimizing compilers were a really important idea that you depend on every day when, when Java does its thing. And some of you have seen me say to you, don't worry about the performance because the compiler will take care of that. That's a really important principle and it's what she believed in and she basically committed her whole career to it. And the simple idea is this, there's gonna be a tool which is so smart it can take your code and produce very, very fast code that does the right thing for your code. Prior to this, the belief was if you wanted fast code, you had to go in and write assembly level code to make it fast because compilers were just a convenience, they did not produce fast code. That was the prior view. Now, optimizing compilers like the sort you find in OpenJDK and in V8 and in other, other compilers can perform better, almost always perform better than handwritten code, which is amazing, okay? And that's because it's a bit like the reason why we use libraries. It's because enormous amount of thought from enormous number of people has gone into developing those compilers that can do very, very clever things with your code. Not only that, but they can do it for whatever machine you might be running on at any given time. So. Um, Fran Allen was one of the founders for that, uh, of that field of optimizing compilers, also parallelizing compilers, which says, how can we write code, take this code here and make it work on a parallel computer? She won the Turing Award in 2006, and I had the privilege of being at the SIGPLAN conference when she gave her acceptance speech. It was very cool. So um, another one of our uh, heroes of computer science. And with that, um, unless there's any questions from Leo, I'm going to sign off and uh, let you guys have a good week. Don't forget, on Friday, we're going to do a revision lecture. We're going to go over... Um, um, we're going to go over material for the mid-semester exam.